Greetings and welcome to another lecture in introductory psychology. This one involves language acquisition. One thing that's very interesting about how humans learn language is that we appear to all learn it in the same way using the same steps. So it isn't something that is learned different no matter what language you're learning whether it's all the various spoken languages that we have or whether it's a signed language. Sign languages also appear to follow some variation of these steps, which is really kind of interesting. Now we're focusing mostly on spoken language here, but it doesn't mean that deaf children don't do some of these steps. They definitely do. So the first stage in language learning, the first event that children use to communicate would be crying. Now this isn't really language. I mean, much of this is not really language. It's communication. You're getting a point across, but you're not following all of the steps that you need for to have a true language. But ask any parent of a baby, and if they've been taking care of that baby for a while, they could tell you that there are different cries for different situations. There's the I'm hungry cry, the I'm wet cry, the I want to get up cry, the, you know, the I'm lonely cry. The, I mean, the, they can definitely let people know what they're feeling by how they are crying. That's communication. And in a way, it's language. Now, starting at about two months of age, children start doing vowel sounds. It's called cooing because it sounds a little bit like doves. They start ooing and eeing and eyeing, and it's much cuter when they do it, of course. But we begin to see vowel sounds at about two months. By about six months of age, they add consonants. Consonant vowel combinations, which we call babbling. This is the goo goo ga goo da di boo boo kind of stage, okay? This is, they sound like words, but they are not. And in many cases, they may be used as words or like words. What, what children seem to be doing during these stages is, first of all, they're picking up the sounds, the phonemes that are used in their particular language. We've learned that if, if a child is not exposed to a particular phoneme within the first year or two, it can be very difficult for them to not only say it, but even to hear it. It's why people grow up speaking at, with accents and why it can be so difficult to get rid of an accent. If you cannot hear the difference between what you are saying and what someone else is saying, then you're not going to be able to learn to produce it yourself. The other really thing, interesting thing that goes on during this stage is, is all babies go through crying and cooing and babbling, even babies that are born deaf. Deaf babies cry and coo and babble, even though they cannot hear themselves. It's part of the reason why most doctors these days were, will test children for hearing problems as early as they can because parents may not always be aware that their child cannot hear because the child is reacting to things, the child sounds like every other child, but they don't, of course, learn to speak because they cannot hear the words, they cannot learn to talk. So they keep babbling and babbling and babbling, and eventually a parent may realize that the child does not respond when uh, they hear a sound when something happens, and that the child is indeed deaf. What this means is that these three stages must be hardwired in human beings. If every human being does these stages the same way in the same order, and as far as we know they do, even the ones that cannot hear themselves, this is not something that children just stumble through and learn to do. This may be one of the few examples of a human instinct because it does seem to follow that pattern. It's unlearned, it's universal, and it's uniform in expression. Everybody does it the same way. Now children are not hearing children are not only picking up the sounds of the language that they use, but they're also picking up what's called prosody, P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. And this is the melody of language. You'll notice that when I'm speaking, I'm not speaking in a monotone. I'm not always speaking at the same rate or at the same loudness level. I vary it because otherwise I would be speaking like this and you would hate it because it sounds like a robot and it would drive you out of your mind and me too. So I'm not going to do that anymore. But this, this pitch and such that I'm using is prosody. We also learn certain patterns in prosody. For instance, when you're asking a question, the pitch goes up at the end. And when you're making a statement, it goes down. So we pick that stuff up. I was once spending some time with a preverbal child. This child was about 10 months of age. She wasn't talking yet. 
But she was babbling like crazy, lots and lots of babbling. And occasionally when, when children are babbling, they will come out with a phrase that sounds exactly like you should understand what they're saying. They say it with great conviction, and it sounds like English. And so this child came up with a sentence that was something like, Gadida Babubu. And all the adults kind of looked at one another and, and went, and then finally someone went, what? And she said, Gadida Babubu. Which I find very amusing, and I still remember it, even though it's been like two decades. Because that child had not only learned that when someone says what, that you repeat what you said, but she also learned that if someone doesn't understand you, you say it slower and louder. That's prosody. And that is also what children are picking up when they are crying and cooing and babbling, assuming, of course, that they can hear themselves. Most children come out with their first words at about one year of age. Some earlier, some later. Whenever you're looking at developmental milestones, as we like to call them, realize that every child is different. Some children will get through these milestones much sooner than others. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with a child that goes through it later, or even that there's something exceptionally right with a child that goes through it earlier. It just means that everyone goes through these at their own pace. Now, a single word sentence is known as a holophrase. And what the kids do is they will use one word as if it is a full sentence. And because of prosody and maybe because of pointing or gesturing or facial expression, we can tell what it is that they are saying. For instance, if a child goes, cookie, they could be saying, are there any cookies? Can I have a cookie? What kind of cookie is it? I mean, it could be any of a number of things. On the other hand, you know, if they go, cookie, that could be, you know, there's a cookie over there, or uh, I like cookies, or I mean, it's a whole phrase. It's a single word sentence. Now, what we often see in children in this whole phrase stage is something called overgeneralization. Luckily, it's named exactly what it is. When you generalize something, it means that you take something from, say, one situation, you apply it to everything that's similar. We generalize. Well, overgeneralization is taking that to a bit of an extreme. Overgeneralization is when a single word is used to mean a whole bunch of barely related things. For instance, a different child that I was around when she was growing up, um, she used the word doggy when she was about a year old to mean all furry four-legged animals. All all four-legged mammals, as it were. They were all doggies. Dogs were doggies. Cats were doggies. Cows and horses were big, were big doggies. They were all doggies. That's overgeneralization. And unfortunately, some parents find out that when their child says da-da in particular, they don't necessarily just mean their father. They may mean all males. That's overgeneralization. Or cookie could be any dessert. Anything that tastes sweet is cookie whether it's cake or pie or candy bar, it's all cookie. That's overgeneralization. And this sort of makes sense because if your vocabulary is only about 20 or 30 words, then you really don't have the sophistication to, to express yourself with better, more precise speech than that. By about 18 months of age, most children are using multi-word sentences. Now, we call this telegraphic speech. Although I really suspect that at some point they're going to change the name because no one uses telegrams anymore. Telegrams used to be a way to send messages long distances. In fact, it used to, 150, 200, it was be the 150, 175, I think 200 years ago we didn't have them. But they used to be the only way to send messages long distance. And telegrams charged by the word. So you did not want to write a three-page letter and then send it by telegram because you would not be able to pay it off. So usually telegrams price like 10 words or less. So people came up with ways to phrase things using 10 words or less. A modern analog would be texting. Most people use abbreviations in texting, whether it's spelling abbreviations or using letters for words or, or whatever, because it just takes too long to sit and text out the entire thing. They leave words out. That's a fairly good analog. Because with telegraphic speech, what children do is they, is they use the important words in the sentence, and they don't necessarily use the sort of non-important ones. 
instead of saying, I would like to go to the mall now, they will say, go bye-bye mall now. And you get the point. Or they won't say, uh, can I please have a cookie? They will say, give me cookie. With maybe a please tacked on after you remind them. So these are two and three, maybe four word sentences that get the point across. But they're missing all the little niceties and such that we tend to look for. By about two years of age, most children are speaking in something resembling complete sentences. Now there's a couple of other very interesting things that happen during this telegraphic speech stage. One is fast mapping. If you've, you've noticed this if you've ever, for instance, said a bad word, said a curse word around a child. <laughs> Because what happens is that kid will learn that word and will say it to your dying day. Fast mapping is the ability of children between the ages of about two and six to pick up words, to learn words, after only hearing them once. They hear a word once. They map it onto their uh, cognitive schema of words. So they sort of take it, learn it instantly, file it away, and thereafter can use it. Children between the ages of 2 and 6 can learn between 5 and 10 words, new words, a day, simply by hearing them. Children of this age absorb language like a sponge absorbs water. I mean, they just soak it in. They don't have to work at it. And all of us who've tried to learn a second language as adults can envy that. Because by the time we hit puberty, we lose the ability, most of us do anyway, lose the ability to be able to pick up a language, to pick up words simply by hearing it. We have to work at it. And we won't pick it up as naturally, and we won't pick it up as easily. It's part of the reason why a lot of schools now are teaching children language beginning in kindergarten. Because if you wait till high school to learn a second language, you're handicapping yourself. In kindergarten, kids will pick up languages without even realizing they're doing it. And they will also keep those languages separate. People sometimes worry, well, will the child confuse these two? No, they won't. Not unless the person they're listening to does. They're very good at that. Children are very, very good at learning language. It's probably one of the things that really best separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Because we know other animals use tools. We know other animals might even use something like clothing and such. But we seem to be the only ones that, that use language. And I have a whole other lecture on that. The other very interesting thing that happens when people learn language is something called over-regularization. Now this can be thought of as applying the rules where the rules don't apply. And you see this in little kids. Languages have rules, we talked about them, called grammar. And they include things, perhaps most obviously, like verb endings. There are regular verbs and there are irregular verbs. Regular verbs are things like walk, W-A-L-K, I walk. If you want to do a past tense, you add an ED to it. With regular verbs, that's what you do. But what's the past tense of the verb to go? It's not goad. It's went. It's only goad if you're four years old. Because a four-year-old will say, quite naturally and automatically, we goad to the store yesterday. And the very interesting thing is you can't correct them. You say, no, 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 we went to the store. And they go, yes, yes, we goad to the store. All of us goad. Or I braked my toy yesterday. Well, no, you broke it. You know, yes, I know I broke it. I'm sorry, I braked it. You know, it's, 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 it's broke. Yeah, they have problems. Because they're applying the rules of regular verbs where the rules don't apply. And what makes this very interesting is, the odds are, the child has never ever heard anyone in their life say, I goad to the store. If we only learn languages the way we learn other things by practice and exposure, the child should never say, I goad to the store. It's part of the reason why some researchers think that we are quite literally born pre-programmed to learn language that we are born ready to find those patterns for verbs and to apply them to everything. It's why we have the fast mapping and can pick up those words, that we are literally born pre-formatted for language. It's still hypothetical because no one has figured out a way to, to test whether or not we do indeed have this programming. No one's managed to find it. But that would explain a whole lot of the stuff from everybody going through the this, this steps in the same way to uh, the, the difficulty of learning language to the difficulty of not learning language. 
In the far distant past, researchers wanted to know what would happen if you took a child and you isolated it from language. Would it still speak? And they found very quickly that you couldn't isolate two children together because they'd make up their own language. You have to work hard to get kids to not learn a language. They have to be really disabled in some way or really deficient because we seem to be pre-programmed for this language. 